Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live today. My name is Esther, and I'll be your host today for our exciting session that we have lined up to you all about travel and family history adventures. So thank you everyone for joining us from all over the world. I see it's uh, quite cold in some of our uh, viewers locations here. Let's see, we have Gracie tuning in from Paris, France. Um, Let's see, we have Harriet from Nova Scotia, Marianne, who says it's minus 20 degrees Celsius there in Finland and quite cold, uh, Karen from Auckland, New Zealand. Um, so thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, if you haven't let yet let us know where where you are where you're located where you're joining us from we love to hear um where everyone is from all the different corners of the world we love that you're joining us today uh, and for our many facebook live sessions so thank you so much for tuning in today so glad to see you here with us uh, we have a fantastic session and before i get to it I'll just let you know about our DNA sale that we have going on here at My Heritage. Uh, if you order now, you can still get DNA kits in time for the holidays. So if you haven't yet purchased gifts for everyone on your list, now is the chance. Uh, you know, not so much longer uh, to still get them in in time for Christmas. So uh, we will put a link in the comments section to the My Heritage DNA sale, and we hope that you're able to take advantage of it. We'll also be giving away a My Heritage DNA kit today to one lucky winner. So we're so thrilled to be able to give this away and help you or a family member uh, uncover more about your family history. So in order to enter our draw today, all that you have to do is leave a comment in the comments section and let us know if My Heritage has led you on any family history travel. Uh, if it's led you, you know, to go visit another city or town or country, we'd love to hear about uh, about that. Or, um, or it could just be plans. You know, do you have plans to do some family history travel? Maybe you're somewhere where travel is more limited right now, um, and you know. Maybe it's just in the plans for the future, which is also fine. Uh, it's always good to, to plan these things uh, in advance, well in advance, so that they're well thought out. So you could also just leave us a comment and let us know, you know, your future plans for family history travel. We would love to hear. So we hope to see a lot of those comments in the comment section. And at the end of today's session, we'll be giving away a My Heritage DNA kit to one lucky viewer. So we're so excited for that draw at the end. Um, as always, feel free to leave comments and questions uh, throughout today's session, and we hope to answer some questions at the end. So I'd like to introduce our speaker. We have with us Jason Schultz. He is a great friend of my heritage. Uh, you know, with, with a little bit of history uh, involved with the company and I'll bring him onto the screen and he can go into more detail uh, about you know his family history travels and journey and how he got involved with my heritage so let me just bring him on here to say hello to everyone hello Jason hey there Esther hey everyone how are you I'm doing well I'm coming at you guys here live from Chicago where I'm visiting my grandmother for the holidays here, and she's a big part of this story. So in case you guys hear any background noise or some uh, kind of half-deaf person yelling stuff, please ignore that. We'll know where it comes from. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so why don't you tell us where your story with, with My Heritage began? Yeah, it actually began in the summer of 2020. Uh, I've got a long history with Sweden that I'll go into during the presentation here. Uh, but with um, the coronavirus and the lockdowns of the borders and all, I was fortunate enough to be able to get swept over the border and film a commercial for My Heritage in Sweden last summer, which was completely unexpected. Uh, a casting agent said they were looking for uh, American voices to record this in Stockholm. And coincidentally, they reached out to me and, uh, and I was able to get that job. I don't normally do commercials. Uh, but I thought I'd just go for it, and it worked out, and I got all the paperwork I needed to to get myself over to Sweden uh, in 2020, and we did that commercial uh, together, which uh, I think was playing on YouTube in various places. Uh, okay, I guess a fast forward to the, the second piece of that, though, is um, 
I was I chatted with uh, your country manager in Sweden, Daphna, and she realized that in in talking about all this that I actually do have Swedish heritage and background. And it was somewhat coincidental that I was invited to participate in this in uh, Stockholm. And uh, going back and forth a little bit, she expressed interest in then doing a little bit more of a, a real world profile on my Swedish heritage because you guys were getting ready to launch your partnership with Expedia and the Heritage Travels. Uh, and so um, some months ago, they sent out a small team to interview me and discuss you know, what that was, uh, what my heritage story is all about. And uh, I, I have little clips. I'll show the audience those today. Fantastic. We can't wait to hear more about how you got, uh, you know, how your journey researching your Swedish roots and, and how that all began. So we'd love, we'd love to hear more. <laughs> okay, great. So let shall me, I jump um, through here? Yeah, let me bring up your slides one moment. Let me put them up here. Okay. I'm going to go to more of a... There we go. All set. Full screen mode here. And please interrupt me. Uh, if you need to stop me for any reason, Esther. Sure. Okay, hi folks. Uh, once again, I'm Jason Schulz, and I'm gonna be talking to you about uh, my, uh, not just the um, the research into my family tree, but actually going into Sweden, uh, traveling there, and a lot of adventures associated with uh, connecting to my heritage. And so this, uh, it's kind of an overview of all that. Hopefully I can fit in. Is there any uh, time limit, Esther, that we need to be mindful of here? Where we go about uh, an hour generally? Yeah, we, we normally like to take questions before. Yeah, something okay. like that. Well, I'll, uh, I'll just go through it at a normal pace and you just please uh, tell me if I need to pick it up or slow it down a little bit. Okay, fantastic. Great, so we'll go into it here. Uh, uh, if you do your DNA profile with uh, my heritage, you'll see the breakdown of what you are, your ethnicities, and mine happens to be 59.3% Scandinavian, 24.3% English, and 16.4% your Eastern European, which is a bit different than what I thought, uh, just being um, told, you know, what my heritage was uh, growing up. Uh, both my parents uh, have one Swedish parent. So I assume that I was 50% Swedish, uh, I had a German grandfather, uh, so 25% German, and then an English grandmother, so 25% English. But when you actually do your DNA breakdown, you'll see it comes out a little bit different. Uh, the Scandinavian and English is about there, but the uh, Eastern European uh, part uh, didn't quite match up exactly as I had just assumed in generalizations. So this is uh, discussing my DNA journey, but specifically focusing on the Scandinavian part, the Swedish part, because uh, that's the one I know the most about. Uh, the one I find the most interesting uh, and the one I've uh, actually been to and I'm more connected with uh, ever since 1998, but the story even goes back uh, further than that. Uh, so I'll get into that, but I've been to Sweden over 30 times. Uh, there's a little bit of a fascination there. Uh, you can't tell from the number of trips that I've had uh, and it's going to be an annual tradition, if not more so for me. So I'll talk about that. All right. So here is a snapshot of the commercial that we did, the, the one in 2020. And I'll just play a moment of that uh, from my other window here, just to give you the feeling of this, which is a, a fictional character. Uh, I think they call, you guys call me Brian Smith, <laughs> Esther, in this one. Uh, but uh, I'll find that particular window here and go into it for a moment. Let me show you. Are you able to see that, Esther? Um, no, we actually can't see it. Still on the slide. Can't. Okay, let me make sure that I'm uh, I'm actually navigating the the live software here correctly. I think then, oops, perhaps I need to uh, just change that window according to those settings. One second here. No problem. Okay, so if I, that's right, I need to remove this frame and then I'll add a new frame for you here. Okay, let's see, let's bring it up now. Uh, window, and that'll be this one. Okay. okay, great. I think that that'll share. Okay, so uh, is that coming up full screen for you, Esther? Yeah, perfect. 
Okay, great. So I won't go through the whole thing, but just to give you a flavor of uh, this is actually shot in Stockholm in 2020. And the reason is LA had shut down, at least what I'm told, LA had shut down for all production. So the only place to really produce things was uh, that were for the American market was somewhere outside of uh, the US, uh, as I'm told. Uh, and that's true because LA did shut down. So we shot this in Stockholm, but it's meant for the American audience. On my heritage, you can build your family tree and make amazing discoveries about your family history really easily. Let me show you how. First, go to myheritage.com, sign up and enter a few names. You, your parents and your grandparents, or whatever information you have. Pretty simple, right? That's my great grandma. My heritage found her name in another family tree, which added 50 relatives to mine in one click. So you can grow your family tree and make new discoveries instantly. All right, that's uh, that's just gives you a little bit of a sample of that one, uh, but then uh, that really wasn't my great grandma, by the way. But uh, really thought of myself. this one will be, uh, and this is the one that actually is my story. Hey, I'm Jason, uh, and uh, we shot this a few months ago uh, in uh, early summer of 2021 here. And as a kid growing Oops, up, just I'll start back here for a few seconds. Hey, I'm Jason, and as a kid growing up just outside of Chicago, I never really thought of myself as being anything other than just an American. I first learned about my Swedish heritage when I was about nine or 10 years old, when our cousin from Sweden came over to visit us. After taking my DNA test, I realized that I'm even more Swedish than I originally thought. Here's a photo of my great, great grandparents, and I really wanted to learn more about their lives. So the best way to do that is to take a trip to Sweden. After building my family tree, it helped me prepare for my trip as it gave me a better understanding of the places that my ancestors came from and helped me connect with new relatives and cousins that I didn't even know I had. The more I learned about my family history in Sweden, the more I wanted to go there and see it with my own eyes. When I arrived, I was amazed at how at home I felt. Family time. My Swedish family gave me the warmest welcome imaginable and threw a big dinner party for me to introduce me to 20 more cousins that I didn't even know that I had. And we all bonded instantly. They gave me a grand tour of the area, and I can't even describe the feeling of seeing the home where my great-grandmother was born. It was just surreal. Outside of spending time in the home with my cousins, oddly, the place that I felt most connected to was the graveyard where my great-great-grandparents were buried. It felt so personal and it just really connected me to my roots. I knew it was going to be an exciting trip, but I had no idea how it was going to influence my course and change my life. Embracing my roots and exploring my origins has been one of the best decisions I ever made. Taking a heritage trip will change you as it did for me. It will open your eyes to the diversity of our world and give you a broader perspective on life. I absolutely recommend it for everyone. Okay, so I'll uh, I'll flip back to the presentation here. Okay, so just um, for anyone in the audience there, that was actually a promo also for my Heritage's partnership with Expedia, and I'll put links um, in the comment section for our travel hub there for anyone that wants to check that out. I will uh, here. Let me bring your okay. slide back up here. Let's see if we can get that up. And let's. Uh, I guess I remove the old one. Uh, hang on, and then I'll. Oh, sorry, Esther. No problem. Me... Technical difficulties. We'll get it. <laughs> yeah, it's just a matter of, uh, I think, making sure that that is the. Um, I don't know why. I see comments here that say that you look very Scandinavian. So I. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's there's a reason for that. <laughs> okay. Your sweet uh, roots ring through. <laughs> they uh, they show show through. Okay, here we go. This should give me a chance to share the window properly. Okay, we should be back online with the presentation here. Okay, yeah, we're back at the beginning. Okay, great. So I will skip forward to where we can uh, resume here and let me just blow it up a little bit so it fills the screen. Okay. So, oops, sorry. So I've got my essay written. It just brought me to another link. I want to go back. All right. Sorry, Esther. Are we uh, back in presentation mode here? Yes, but we're still on the starting screen. Uh, there we okay. go. 
I got it. Okay, so this uh, this was the the second uh, promo that we did that I just showed you guys there. So uh, it really all started with uh, the DNA, this whole thing that I have going on with Sweden. And uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, back at the just before the turn of the last century, uh, Sweden lost about 30% of its population to the U.S., the big Swedish emigration. Uh, three out of every 10 Swedes left Sweden because of hard times over there and came to the U.S. in hopes of a brighter future. Uh, and so that's how our family came to the U.S., at least about one of the branches of our family. Uh, there is another grandparent there uh, that came even before the emigration uh, happened. But uh, So we have two sides of the family that came from Sweden and settled in the U.S. in the Chicago area. There's a, a lot of you might realize that a lot of Swedes and Scandinavians went to uh, Minnesota, but Chicago was another big population of Swedes. And so uh, that's where it happened to be that my part of the family uh, settled. And I became uh, interested in Sweden because of DNA, but also now it's uh, emerged into like the natural, the cultural, historical, the family connections, of course, a lot of friends over there, and just the opportunities that Sweden has presented to me. So it's so much more than my DNA, but the DNA really is what started it and had called me back to go retrace the the steps of my forefathers that's all in the uh the genes here so on the left side you see uh on my mom's side the peter naslin family that is my great great grandfather and he came over in the 1860s and then the picture on the right is the charles nelson family which is on my dad's side uh, and they're the ones that came during the big Swedish emigration around the, the turn of the century. Uh, and you can see the dates on those photos. So the one on the left, 1885, was actually taken here in the U.S. after he had already settled. And then the other family photo, uh, the Nelson side there, formerly Nelson. And a lot of you know that they changed their names for simplicity's sake and adopted a little bit more of an American version of their name. Uh, Nestland was the name. The A with two dots sounds a little bit more like uh, an E. Nestland became Nasland. And then Nilsson, of course, became Nelson. Okay, and then uh, here is on the Nelson side, my father's side. This is my great grandma, Amelia, uh, Anna Amelia, uh, with my grandmother there uh, that she's holding in the little white dress and her older sisters. And they had another. Uh, brother, the oldest brother, Carl, who's not pictured there. This picture is from about 1922. And there's my grandma and I uh, just this year. She celebrated her 101st birthday. And uh, she's here in Chicago, which is where I'm staying right now. All right. And here we have uh, the close-ups of her parents and herself. And this is fun because, whoops, I'm going to go back. Uh, these should be, how do they work here? These should be Uh, animated photos and they were of course working when I tested it out but at the moment they don't seem to yeah we don't see them animating but no, definitely, I don't either. I'm sure it's amazing their uh, their faces animated and, and moving <laughs> thank yeah that's one of the tools that I was really blown away with uh, on my heritage and I'm actually super disappointed right now that it doesn't seem to have inherited that quality from the PDF that I exported. Now it's kind of freaking out a little bit. Okay, well, nevertheless, uh, if you guys browse around on the site, you can see how this animation tool works. And for me, that was just such an incredible thing. And when I showed my grandmother, she couldn't believe to see something where her father was actually moving and blinking and smiling and all. It's incredible. Anyway, so uh, going back to my grandmother here, uh, she uh, has lived her entire life. She was the first generation American born to two Swedish parents who came during the emigration, but she was born here in the US and she's celebrated a uh, hundred years living here in Crystal Lake, the area of Chicago that we're from about an hour Northwest of the city. And so they did a little write up on her uh, a year ago, year and a half ago uh, about her spending all 100 years living here in Crystal Lake as a first generation uh, Swede. All right, so uh, as I mentioned that uh, both my parents have half Swedish blood. So my dad's half Swede, my mom's half Swede. So that makes me a half Swede as well, uh, or even more so according to the DNA. Uh, so you can see there I'm at the bottom. Uh, going off to the left is on my father's side, which is the Nelson and Johnson family, formerly Johan's daughter. 
uh, but she simplified it to Johnson when she came here uh, and then um, met my great grandfather and got married. And then on the right side is the Nasland side or Nesland and Byland. Uh, and they uh, came a generation before, as I mentioned, that they were here uh, in the mid to late 1800s, whereas the other uh, side of the family came right at the turn of the century. All right, so I was really curious of who we were, and I thought, wow, we're Vikings and all that. As I look into it, no, sadly, we're not Vikings. We're a bunch of farmers. <laughs> so uh, Bonde, I think, was the, the term. Um, and that's uh, why they left, because uh, you know there was, I guess, some famine and drought in Sweden at that time, and that's what pushed a lot of the farmers to head towards America. On my uh, father's side, uh, uh, great-grandpa Charles and great-grandma Amelia uh, were from two different parts of Sweden. Um, Charles is from Helsingborg, which is on the west coast of Sweden. I have a red circle down on the southern part of Sweden there, on the left-hand side of Sweden, just above Halmstad. Uh, or Homsta, as they call it. And then on the right side of the country, you see Kalmar. Well, that's actually an island there that I'm circling called Öland. And that's where my great grandmother, Amelia, was born. And then on my mother's side, both of my grandparents came from Hernesan, which is uh, about midway, a little higher than midway up on the east coast of Sweden. And that's where uh, Peter Nasland, or Per, as he was known in Sweden, uh, came from. And he was. Um, uh, a sailor there, and we have a, a fantastic family legend uh, talking about his uh, sailing exploits. All right, so there's a close-up of uh, Öland, uh, what it looks like labeled as Kalmar, but Öland is the island, Kalmar is the inland city just across the bay, uh, and that's where my cousin Ose uh, Helgeson, but she's from the Johan's daughter side, so uh, I'll show the connection to Ose, and this is how we really, uh, this is how I really got connected to Sweden was through OSI. So the connection to OSI is we share uh, uh, great, great grandparents. Well, actually it's my great, great grandparents and it's her great grandparents. So we got uh, JP and Anna uh, Nilsson up there at the top. And then uh, my great grandma, Amelia and her grandma, Elma. Uh, and then my grandmother, who I'm staying with here, Almeida, is cousins with her father, Elwood, uh, and then my dad and Osi are second cousins, which makes me a second cousin once removed to Osi. And I sit somewhere in between the generation of uh, her and uh, and her kids. So uh, I'm, I'm just as close to Osi as a second cousin once removed, or also my third cousins, uh, which are her children. All right, so she lives in Karlskrona. So the family moved from Öland and came inland, uh, and that was uh, near the bottom of Sweden as well. And uh, she's there with her family, Jürgen and Gabriel, Alexander and Louise. I'm close to all of them. Uh, and really what started it is that uh, Osi uh, came over in the 80s to visit us in the U.S. And that was my first exposure to uh, this you know, foreign concept of, you know, the melting pot of America where we're not just, you know, Americans, but we are Americans with a heritage. Uh, my grandmother had gone back once in the 70s to see where her mother was born. And in the 80s, uh, Osi came over several times and that's what really struck me. And then uh, after college, I decided that I needed to take a big trip and go to Europe. Well, where am I going to go? I'll go where I already know some people. I'll go to Sweden. So I visited Osi and her family there uh, in Karlskrona. And so uh, here is uh, a little bit more of a map close-up of uh, Öland. You can see that. I'm not sure if my cursor shows up as I, I draw on the screen here. But uh, Longlet is the little village where they came from. And this is where that family house is. And so Osi took me there to see where my great-grandmother was born. And this is supposed to be a movie that plays. Let's see if that actually works. You know what I'm going to do, Esther, is I'm going to go to the um, the actual software that I made the presentation in, so that sure. I can so I can actually launch it because it's a bit frustrating that it's not actually going to no show. No problem. Yeah, let's see if that works. No problem. Okay. 
In the meantime, I just want to remind everyone, if anyone has questions for Jason about his journey or um, his travels, definitely put it in the comments section. Uh, I see Linda wrote, I'm enjoying this presentation. I grew up in Chicago and my mother was Swedish. Her grandfather was Charles Nelson from Kalwar and other ancestors were from way up north. Oh, that's interesting. You know what I'm going to do is I'm just going to retreat a little bit as long as I'm in the authoring software here. I'm gonna, I know, I, that's right. I'm going to have to show this as the window that we're presenting. Okay, so let's remove the window and share a new one. And that will be this one. Sure, let's get that up. Okay, maybe the animations uh, will, sh will show now. There we go. Are you seeing it? Yes. Okay, that's that actually was really impressive to my grandmother, uh, was being able to see some life added back into these still photos of her parents. So I wow. just thought that was so cool. And, uh, you know, there's other tools as well. Uh, whoops. Uh, in the software with the colorization and cleaning up the photos and all that. But it's, it's really cool to play around with all that stuff. So it's really a fun tool. Okay, and I'm going to skip back to where we had left off instead of shrinking it down. It's easier just to, to go here. Okay, and so I asked my grandmother uh, about you know the emigration and uh, her parents coming over uh, and all of her parents and her, especially her mother. Uh, that's the one we know most about, her mother, Amelia, and uh, all her brothers and sisters. Uh, and how is it that, you know, uh, if all these brothers and sisters came to the U.S., how is it that Osi still lives in Sweden? So I was curious about that, and this is what she told me. Well, back then in Sweden, what we heard from my mother, they were poor and didn't have a lot of money. And so everybody, the Swedes, a lot of Swedes came over because they all heard how great it was in America. So they all wanted to come and make a good living. So they oh, yeah. came over, Uncle Ed and Gus and Elma and my mother, they came over. Well, uh, Uncle Ed and they all talked it over and they said it wasn't good for grandma to have to be left there alone. So Uncle Ed asked Elma if she would be willing to go back and live there and take care of Grandma. And she said yes, and Uncle Ed would, said he would pay her to go back and take care of her. So she went back and took care of her mother. Say hello to all of them from me. Good will sing today. Okay, that's Grandma talking a little bit about how Osi almost was an American. Her uh, grandmother, Elma, came over with the rest of the brothers and sisters, and then they decided to send Elma back to Irland to watch over uh, grandma, uh, my great-grandma. And so presumably great-grandpa, JP, um, Johan Peter, had passed away, so grandma was there alone. So they needed one of the, the youngest uh, daughter to go back and stay with grandma, which maintained the Swedish branch of our family. So oddly, you know, 80% of the Swedes are now Americans and only 20% or so have stayed in Sweden. Uh, so as I think I've heard, there's more Swedish blood in the U.S. than there actually is in Sweden now. Whether or not that's true, I think it's probably almost true, if not true indeed. So uh, I went over there and visited uh, OC and family in 98, and they gave me a tour around uh, Karlskrona, the area where they live, which is a really quaint town, a military town, uh, one of the biggest squares in all of Europe. And there was some photos from that when I first brought up her little profile. But when they brought me around to Irland, that's what really hit me is uh, I saw the birthplace of my great uh, grandmother. And you can see JP and Anna there in the middle. Uh, the colorized photo, I played with that on my heritage. It was fun to clean it up and colorize it. Uh, but seeing their gravestone, uh, the grave marker there on the right, uh, that's where I, I distinctly remember a defining moment where I felt so connected to that soil, uh, knowing that those were my great, uh, great grandparents uh, and hearing some stories about them and all that. It felt very, very personal to me. And that was the trigger that started my uh, fascination with Sweden. Beyond just uh, the family heritage, it grew so much more into these other areas, like I had mentioned. 
All right, so that was on my father's side, the Nelson and Johan's daughter side. Uh, but then on my mother's side, we have the Nasland or the Nesland uh, side. And uh, Peter, as we knew him here in the States, my great, great grandfather, pictured there on the left, was a Swedish sailor. And you can see we have some family letters. These are total gems for us. Uh, the original letters that have been written to him uh, by various people. And this one is from Gustav Ustland. Uh, and this was a sea captain uh, talking about the, him as a sailor. Uh, and this was written in 1862 uh, when he was in uh, Hugsha, which is the uh, area in the north part of Sweden that I showed on that map near Hernesand. Uh, and so we know that he was in 1862, we know that he was still in Sweden working as a sailor. A merchant sailor. And then I went on to go figure out a little bit about this uh, little village of uh, Ness, where they came from. And I assume that that's got to be connected to the last name, Nesland. And you can see uh, the area there uh, on the top uh, picture, the region of Sweden, uh, about a little bit more than halfway up. And then the the, the blue and green photo showing uh, how we're inland from Hernesand and above Hernesand, which is right in the middle bottom of the map. You go up through uh, those lakes and that channel up there to Ness. And then uh, another guy I connected to uh, sent me a map of that area from 1821. And then I went on to Google Photos and got the most recent one I could find. And there's a street marker uh, pointing to the village of Ness one kilometer away. So I have got to get there at some point and see this little village and try to understand more about it. All right, so uh, that's the, as I mentioned, the, the village Ness, and here is that same map from 1821. And I was also sent some photos of the Naslin farm, the Neslin farm. Uh, the one on the top there is one of the original photos of the farm, but it had burned uh, apparently. And so about 200 meters down the hill, they rebuilt the farm uh, in the 1950s, uh, pictured at the bottom there. Uh, so I'm super curious to know what their farm was like when I get up there too and try to identify the land uh, where my family came from. So that's super interesting for me. And uh, I wouldn't know about these photos or any of this if it weren't uh, for uh, the fact that I got connected to some relatives and some historians uh, up that area. All right, so I mentioned that there was a bit of a family legend around Peter's voyage to the U.S., uh, and that had to have happened between 1862, which is the one letter that I showed you, and 1865. And um, family legend says, and uh, there's some evidence to show that it's at least uh, in part true, is that he was shipwrecked off of Cape Horn in South America. And we do have records showing that he was in port in Buenos Aires. So we know that he was in South America on a sailing vessel. Uh, and so getting shipwrecked off of Cape Horn, he washed ashore, and supposedly he was the only survivor of this vessel that went down. And the local indigenous uh, Indians there uh, nursed him back to health. And they had been previously visited by some missionaries and had become Christian. So they also ministered to Peter, my great-great-grandfather, uh, as they were helping nurse him back to health. And he vowed that if he were to survive this ordeal, that he would uh, build a church uh, and, um, and uh, devote his life to the Lord. Well, he waited, made his way up to San Francisco in the 1860s, and he waited for the Civil War to end. And then after the Civil War, he then went back east and settled in Chicago. And I think that's where he sent for uh, my great-great-grandmother because she's also from the same area where he's from. So he must have known her uh, when he was in Sweden. Otherwise, the odds of them being from that same little area and finding each other in Chicago, it's possible, I suppose, but I, I have to feel that they had a connection uh, before he had a shipwreck. And you can see at the top there, there's the church. He actually fulfilled his promise and he built the Swedish Mission Church here in Crystal Lake uh, where all the Swedes would meet and they held services in Swedish. There was a lot of Swedes in Crystal Lake. Uh, back at that time. And so Peter was the founder uh, of that church, and it's now evolved and grown, and um, and the the area where it is is now a Salvation Army uh, facility, but uh, he was the founder of that church, as he said he would do. All right, so in doing the family research, uh, I was you know fascinated to find out more, try to get it back as far as I could, and I connected my family tree to another guy's in Sweden, 
And that took me from, you know, like the 1860s of what I knew, my very limited knowledge. And it got me all the way back to the 16th century to a guy named Eric of Vestenshu. I love it. It wasn't even a last name. He was just Eric of Vestenshu. That sounds totally medieval and classic. And so his son, Hokan, uh, was born in 1550. So I can only assume, let's say, Eric was about you know 25 years old, maybe 20 years old when he had a son, maybe 16. But you know somewhere around 15, 25, 15, 30, somewhere in there, Eric of Vestenshu was born. Uh, and I would be really interested to learn more. I've uh, kind of got stopped at this place. I haven't been able to go back any further yet, and I haven't really been able to learn any details about Eric. Uh, but at least I, I've got that name by virtue of connecting to other people's family tree. And so that's been a lot of fun knowing that I can get my family history back to the 16th century. All right, we mentioned we had these letters. Well, there's other letters here. Uh, and the one on the top, hard to read. Uh, and I've had some of these translated to help me understand them better. Uh, his brother, Eric, wrote a letter to him in the US in 1865. Well, if you remember, the letter to, from his sea captain was in 1862. So somewhere between 1862 and 1865, he must have settled in the US and Eric wrote to him there. And then his brother, Yuan, uh, wrote the, the one on the bottom. And we have a lot of letters from Yuan to my uh, great grandfather, uh, great great grandfather, uh, Peter. And there's just so much uh, family history in these letters talking about the brothers and uh, how they had had one of the their nieces, one of their brother's daughters was living with them because the situation at home wasn't quite good for her. So when they give greetings, uh, they say, you know, greetings from ourselves and the niece. And so when I go to the family tree, I'm able to see that the niece was connected to another brother. And it's so fun to actually uh, add some life to the family tree with what you can kind of surmise with these stories and you know buying farms and people moving and people passing away it's just absolutely fascinating and so we're so lucky to have these old letters written to peter i can only imagine the letters that peter wrote back to them and i just wonder if somebody in sweden has you know perhaps the descendants of johan or of eric has letters from Peter. And it'd be great to find out the other side of those communications. And it's even funny because when Johan will write, he says, wow, it's such a surprise to see uh, Britta, Peter's wife, Britta Elizabeth Byland, my great, great grandmother is like, what happened to her teeth? Uh, so they were shocked to see how much she had aged from one photo to the next apparently, because she was missing all her teeth. All right, so here we have all the Naslin siblings, and it was my uh, great-great-grandfather Peter seems to be the only one in this instance that made his way to America, whereas on the Nelson side of the family, all of the siblings came and one went back. Actually, another one went back as well uh, after that, but on the Naslin side, all of the siblings except my great-great-grandfather Peter stayed in Sweden, and they're largely still up in the north from what I can tell. Uh, and so you can see a list of the uh, family the brothers and sisters there, the two letters, one from his uh, brother Eric or Olaf uh, Erickson Naslin, but they called him Eric. And then the other one from his brother Johan or John, I think he even might sign his letter unless I'm not seeing the A in there. So those brothers were in touch with one another and uh, they had their, um, their father, uh, Eric and Anna, the great, the grandmother. All right, so I went back with all of this inspiration, and I wanted to, you know, I was working in LA, uh, working at Warner Brothers Studios. I was very inter interested in entertainment, and I had helped some friends uh, make a little independent movie, not with Warner Brothers, but on the side, weekends and such. And I was inspired. I wanted to make my own. So I thought, I'm going to make a movie about Sweden. So I came up with this idea. I was fascinated that Sweden was a kingdom. Uh, you know, we're used to presidents and senators, but they have a king and a queen and the parliament and such. And so I was really fascinated by the royalty and wanted to come up with an idea. So I call it the Swedish princess. And it's just, it just was meant to be a light romantic comedy about an American, somewhat loosely based on my uh, adventure of feeling like I left um, this black and white world and went into the full color of, the, you know, of Oz. Uh, like the Wizard of Oz is what it felt like to me, emerging into this country with all the sights and sounds and colors and tastes and flavors. And it was just unbelievable to me. So I was inspired to come up with this idea. Um, I even made a little movie trailer for it here. Swedish 
Välkommen till Sverige. Welcome to Sweden. So I went through so much effort to try to get a movie made over there. And I was learning how do they make movies in Sweden. I really want to celebrate my Swedish heritage. I want to do a film that embraces it. And, you know, Sweden itself would have become a character in this. And so I came up with this concept and did research. There had not been any movies really about Sweden since like the 1970s. There was like a Bob Hope one and a Paul Newman one. And I'm like, wow, this is such a ripe opportunity to do a, to do a movie about Sweden. But I was just, unfortunately, it was before my time. I went back and forth maybe 13, 14 times just related to trying to get this film made. Uh, meeting with people, you know, I worked at Warner Brothers and the Warner Brothers would never have a conversation in LA uh, with me about such things. You know, I'm just a super, super small fish uh, in a huge lake in LA. But when I went over to Sweden, uh, I had some good fortune and then I got some publicity uh, about uh, the film because I had invited the Crown Princess Victoria to actually take a guest appearance in my film and that became a kind of a big deal. So the front page of their newspapers one day, I was back in LA not really thinking much about it. I was just trying to make my efforts. But then a lot of friends in Sweden that I had started meeting said, your movie is on the front page of every newspaper in Sweden today. And this is about 2000, uh, I was trying to do this. And uh, the press somehow got wind of the fact that I was trying to make a movie and that I had invited Crown Princess Victoria to take a guest uh, appearance in the film. And I was so worried, uh, I was like, uh oh, you know, uh, here's the media doing their snooping around. And I had never, you know, been involved in anything media related before, never tried to make a movie before. I went to film school, but I really didn't know how to make a movie other than the fact that, you know, I had helped on some. So I was just out there just kind of stumbling my way through all of this. I was meeting with uh, Ingmar Bergman's producer about it. And she's like, what do you want? I'm like, I don't know. I just want to make a movie. I didn't even know how to pitch my idea correctly. But uh, this came out and I was so worried that the, the royals would be upset with me. Uh, for like trying to use them uh, as leverage to, you know, get some momentum on getting my film made. And I thought, oh, that's it for me. And I thought, oh, th this is it. You know, that story said Warner Brothers producer Jason Schultz is making a huge movie in Sweden with uh, Princess Victoria. And I thought, okay, number one, the Royals are going to be mad at me. And number two, Warner Brothers is going to be really mad at me. I'm not a Warner Brothers producer. I was just working in low-level administration back then. I'm like, I'm going to get fired, and I'm not going to be able to go back to Sweden because the Royals are going to have me banned. This is where my mind went. And uh, so I told my bosses, you know, I was like, hey, uh, this is what I've been doing, and this is what I've said, but this is what the media said. I just want you to know I didn't actually – you know, misrepresent myself. Everybody knew I worked at Warner Brothers, but I was very clear that I was doing this independently, but the media didn't care because this makes a better story. Uh, and thankfully my boss said, hey, I'm so glad you told me. Uh, don't worry about it because nobody cares about Sweden anyway. <laughs> I thought, wow, what a little dig on Sweden. But in fact, a lot of people do. And the Sweden entertainment is a huge export for them, especially music. Uh, but at any rate, I carried on and I went back and forth. I never got the film made uh, but it did lead to a lot of other opportunities. Uh, you can see there was actually a, a lot of different media coming out in their publications. And what it did do is that somebody was interested in doing a story about my family connection to Sweden. And so they ran a story about me um, coming uh, back to Sweden, researching my family roots in both Karlskrona, which is where uh, Ose lives. And then also they did a similar story with a spin towards the Hernasan area. And so those two articles that came out in those areas wound up leading me to, oh, before I get ahead, uh, it, the, that movie, as I mentioned, led to other opportunities, which was an unexpected side hustle that I, I did outside of Warner Brothers. Uh, nights, weekends, I'd take some time off and I started producing uh, music videos, editorials, and commercials for Swedes when they wanted to film in the U.S. They said, hey, we know that you've got your project in Sweden and that you're doing uh, a lot to try to make that happen. But in the meantime, we have this thing shooting in L.A. or Vegas. Could you help us out with that? And so I unexpectedly started putting budgets together and producing these things, even uh, meeting with Joel Kinnaman, you know, Robocop or the guy from Suicide Squad up there on the right. And we did one with... Uh, Ozzy Osbourne uh, for this place called Metal Casino that he was uh, involved with. And so, you know, I've been able to meet a couple of cool people by virtue of my Swedes hiring me, even doing uh, some races. Even a couple weeks ago, I was uh, doing some of these Nitro Rallycross races, these little derby cars that run around these dirt tracks. And a, a Swedish friend of mine hired me to help them do some filming for that. 
uh, Anna Diaz down there at the bottom. Uh, she's a, a singer uh, in Sweden, and we shot a music video with her in LA. So it's been uh, really fun. All right, but that little local story uh, led me to uh, one of the key pieces that I really needed to to learn more. Bjorn, uh, he lives up near Hernesan, where uh, the Naslan side of the family comes from, and he contacted me because he saw the article and said, hey, uh, I'm a genealogist and a historian up here, and I know all about your family. And he connected me to several more people, uh, Michael Ustman and Sven Eric, and different people that are connected to that area. They run Facebook pages about that area. Uh, and I know Michael and I share a relative. We have yet to determine exactly what our connection is, but uh, my relatives are in his family uh, tree, and he just has to run a little uh, program to search where our common ancestor is so we can see what the point of origin of our family connection is. But it's been really great. And, you know, that without that uh, media coverage, I never would have met Bjorn, and I never would have met these guys. So that uh, little bit of attention really helped open doors for me, and I'm so thankful uh, that Bjorn was able to facilitate that. All right, so uh, we can go back to the uh, My Heritage family tree here, and we can see uh, on the top left we have Eric Israelson Nesland and Anna Margareta Stexen. Uh, those were uh, Peter or Pear's uh, parents, and you can see that uh, Peter's brother Olaf, Eric, uh, which is Eric the, from that letter, uh, uh, had uh, Johan Peter. Johan Peter had Johan Valdemar, and that and Johan Valdemar had Mona and Oli. And now I am friends with Mona and Oli Nesland uh, in Sweden. So they're in my mom's generation, uh, but I've been able by virtue of this connection to uh, Bjorn and others connect to some real world relatives. So I had to go back in time to figure out our common ancestor, which was Eric Israelson uh, to become Nesland. Uh, and I went down the, the Peter Naslin route, and then Mona and Oli came down from the Olaf Eriksson Naslin uh, branch. So that's been really fun to see this in action and actually connect me to some real world living relatives in Sweden that I'm now friends with. I've yet to meet them face to face, but we've talked a lot on Facebook and uh, we're connected that way. So on the Nelson side, I've actually spent time with my dad's family, Osi and all her family. And so it's been great with the face-to-face -face interactions and the, the tight bonds that we've formed that way. Uh, so I just hope to do the same thing on the Naslin side. All right, there's just a little bit more of a close-up of Mona and uh, Oli. I just uh, got those pictures from their Facebook profiles. And then Michael, I mentioned, uh, we're going to figure out what our connection is here, but he is a, a family member as well. So... As you know, it became more than just about the DNA and the family connections. As I started going back and forth, trying to make my film, and also just enjoying the culture, the food, the architecture, the sights, the sounds, the colors, the language, the customs, the traditions, you know, there's just so much in Sweden that captivated me, literally captivated me. Uh, and I, I couldn't shake it, and nor did I want to. So I just keep going back for more and more and more to understand, you know, you hear uh, like ice bears in the street. And there's a lot of myths about Sweden and people say, oh yeah, I, I tell them I'm going to go to Sweden. They're like, we'll have a lot of fun on your trip to Switzerland. In the same conversation, they'll, they'll confuse it with Switzerland. Think of ice bears in the streets, the Swedish bikini team, which they aren't even Swedes at all. So I've been able to really unravel, you know, what is, uh, what is Sweden and start to understand what the true nature of Sweden really is. Uh, both its ancient history as well as its, uh, as a modern culture, a very diverse culture. And we hear about Sweden on the news a lot uh, and their approach being a little bit different to how they do things. So here's just a mix of pictures. This is a, just like a cross-section of everything that I feel like I've come across in Sweden, from their sustainability and green energy push to a, a huge IT uh, um, influence, Ericsson. And, you know, for a country of 10 million people, they have so many international brands, uh, uh, Ericsson and Ikea and Saab and Volvo. And there's just so many things that you've heard of that you probably don't even realize is Swedish. You know, ABBA, the band, uh, huge international export back in the you know, 70s and 80s. Uh, you know, they've got their old warship, the Vasa, you see there on the right, uh, a ship that um, in the, I believe the 1500s, uh, commissioned by the grandson of King Gustav Vasa, uh, set out to sail a magnificent, glorious ship, uh, and it went out about a uh, couple hundred meters and immediately sank. <laughs> it sat there for about 400 years 
Uh, and then finally, they resurrect, re resurrected that ship back in the 1950s, and it's sitting in a museum in Stockholm, the Vasa Museum in Stockholm, a perfectly preserved Swedish galleon, and it is so impressive. I have to say, if you ever go visit, it's worth the 15 bucks or whatever the ticket is to go in and see that warship. Uh, it's just magnificent. And, you know, Sweden's full of industry and timber and farming and all that, and so it's got its Sami, uh, they're, they're natives up north that herd the reindeer. You can see her on the top in the middle. Uh, their traditions and customs with their midsummer festival, dancing around the Maypole and all, it's fantastic. So I love really exploring Sweden and all the different elements about it. Uh, you know, connecting with the family and wanting to see things beyond the family. I wanna go up north. That's where, you know, my family is from, you know, so somewhat north in Harnesan, but even further north up towards the Arctic Circle. You know, they've got the Ice Hotel uh, and the Sami herding the reindeers. And, uh, you know, there's no cell phone signals when you go out camping in the woods there and all that. It's just got to be magnificent. And, you know, the northern lights and all that. So that's the next part of Sweden I really need to unravel is pushing up north. And my heritage showed me that I have 1,400 relatives living throughout Sweden. So there should be no shortage of opportunity for me to go crash with somebody because uh, we're going to be considered family. Uh, so I've uh, now got to start, you know, looking up uh, these 1,400 relatives and start making my plans to see them. All right, so the things about Sweden, as I mentioned, it's just, you know, the food, they've got their schutbullar, which is meatballs, and kropkakar, which is these potato balls filled with meat. Uh, that's actually um, a delicacy that comes from Irland, the island where my great-grandmother uh, was born. Uh, and uh, lax is their salmon, wrecker, shrimp. You can find there's shrimp everywhere. There's salmon everywhere in Sweden. It's part of so many meals and dishes, open-faced sandwiches and all. It's, they've got delicious food, and their desserts are really fantastic. My favorite dessert is a, called the Princess Torta, uh, the princess cake. And it's got this green marzipan with, like, uh, raspberry and almond. And like, it's the number one dessert in the world for me. And that's Swedish. And it's not just because I'm Swedish. It's actually amazing bakery. So uh, they've really got their food scene going on. They've got a lot of uh, events and festivals, Valborg in the spring, chasing away spirits with a big bonfire, midsummer celebrating um, the fertility, dancing around the maypole, quacking like frogs in their old world costumes. You can see in the kind of the middle picture there, the Kreft Weva. This is their crayfish party towards the end of summer. And that's a whole tradition unto itself, wearing little like almost like birthday party hats, cracking the crayfish open, sucking the juice out of the head, eating the crayfish, singing songs. I mean, it's so much fun. And then Lucia, of course, uh, it's a very charming festival with the girl wearing candles in her hair and they do their processional in the darkest, uh, I think it's like the 13th of December, uh, shortest day of the year uh, with just very hauntingly charming music. And they crown their uh, Lucia queen. Uh, and then of course, Yule, which is Christmas uh, for them. And it's if you're going to spend time in Sweden, for me, you go in the summer when the weather is great and fantastic. And it's, you know, it's still temperate. It's not warm like Arizona, but it's just beautiful weather in the summer. And then if you're going to do any time in the winter, save it for December because that's what's got the charm uh, and uh, that cozy feeling, uh, even though it's the shortest, darkest month. You know, and the Swedes will say that everything is kind of okay up through September, a little bit in October. But for them, November is a horrible month. It's just boring. Nothing really going on. It picks up again in terms of the mood in December because of Christmas and Lucia. But then come January, February, March, they want to get out of there and travel to Thailand or the Canary Islands because it is cold and dark and there ain't nothing going on. So you got to be strategic about when you go to Sweden. So it's the summer or save it for Christmas. And this is just the feeling that I get. There's me and my buddy. Uh, he met me in Stockholm one year as he was traveling around. This is what you see. It looks like a burrito. It's actually a snow cone of mashed potatoes. It's called a tunbrud roule. <laughs> it's one of my favorite just, you know, um, uh, it's, a, it's street food, one of those cheap foods. It's a snow cone of mashed potatoes wrapped in a tortilla with a hot dog stuck in the middle. Uh, some ketchup mustard, some uh, shrimp salad in there, and it's one of those things like for six bucks, you just, you'll be full all day. But they have this thing on the left there, it's called a smorgas torta. It's basically a sandwich cake. Looks like a cake, but it's just a, it's just layers of bread and sandwich and mayonnaise and all these fantastic flavors. So just like the dinner parties are fun, the restaurants there are fun, a lot of good friends and laughter, the architecture is great, I love all of it. 
And really, everything comes down to the people. Uh, on the, the two right-hand side pictures, you can see Osi there in the snow with her dogs. She's huge into the dogs. And then her daughter, Louise, uh, there with the horses. And Louise is really into the horses. So they're a big uh, animal family. Well, uh, you know, Osi was here in the 80s, uh, and she came to work on a horse farm in California uh, when she visited us. She visited us in Chicago. Our family had moved to Texas. She visited us in Texas and brought her uh, husband and her father with, uh, Jurgen, her husband, and uh, Elwood, her father, and in Texas. But then she went on uh, with her and a friend one time to work at a, like a dude ranch or horse ranch in California. Well, Louise kind of followed in her footsteps. Louise came out and visited me with a friend and stayed with me for a while. And she also went to work on a ranch. Uh, and then she, uh, uh, her brother, uh, Gabriel, came with his wife and visited me a couple of times. So it's it's become a, quite a back and forth routine with us as family members here, uh, with me, of course, going back every year. And then uh, the other photos are just friends that I've met, lifelong friends, deep friendships that I've got. Uh, in Sweden. And it, it, in a lot of respects, it exceeds what I've even got in LA. Uh, so, you know, I have um, a really good, strong base. It's a second home for me there in Sweden now. And it's because of these people. All right. And that just leaves me with so much more to see and do as I continue on with my Swedish adventures. Uh, you know, they've got the, the white king, that uh, white albino moose, uh, that lives down near my buddy's uh, family estate in Varmland, uh, a county in Sweden, uh, going towards Norway. Uh, they've got the Swedish mountains that I haven't been to yet. Uh, just interesting architecture, their military craft. I want to go out on one of those boats sometime if they have something similar that I could do. The, the old world moss huts and the skiing and all. There's just a lot more of Sweden uh, that I'll never be able to get through all of it. But I'm just glad to know that there's so much waiting for me so that when I start branching out beyond Karlskrona and Öland and Stockholm and start pushing north, uh, there's just going to be so much more to see and do. Okay, that really sums it up. Uh, you've got my Instagram link down there on the bottom. Uh, I post, when I'm in Sweden, I post all the time. When I'm home uh, or when I'm, you know, here at Grandma's, uh, then, you know, I'll be posting. When I'm at home, I don't find it as inspiring, so I don't post as much. But when I'm traveling or anything related to Sweden, you'll find it on my Instagram. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the stories and all that there. So by all means, if you want to see a little bit more of snapshots of, uh, snapshots of real world life in Sweden, walk in the streets, doing stories, I have those all saved on my profile so you can get a kind of a feeling of what everyday life is in Sweden. So with that, I will go back to my monitor here my camera. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Wow. What a, what a journey you took us through. And that was just so fascinating to see, you know, all the um, exposure that you've had to the culture and the tastes and, and, and you really walked us through it. That was really uh, fascinating. So um, when was your first trip to Sweden? My first trip was 98. Uh, that's when I decided that I had to, you know, because after college, everybody talks about backpacking through Europe. Well, I didn't really want to backpack through Europe. I didn't have anybody that was anxious to go traveling with me at the moment. So I thought, well, I'll just go where I already know people. And, you know, that was uh, Osi's family in, in Sweden. So I, I did a, a little bit of a, a roundabout to get there. I stopped in London for a day and took the big bus tour around London, went to Berlin, and then took the train back up through uh, into Copenhagen. And this was before they had the bridge between Copenhagen and Malmo, Sweden, that connected the two um, bits of land together. Uh, and so I took a catamaran from uh, Malmo, I mean, from Copenhagen over to Malmo, where Osi's husband, Jürgen, met me with a couple of the kids, picked me up. And that was a funny story. So no sooner did I leave Denmark to get to Sweden, uh, Jürgen picks me up. And then we drive north to Helsingborg, <laughs> which is where... Um, my great grandfather Charlie Nelson came from. I didn't really realize it back then, uh, and I was just there to actually explore Helsingborg this last summer. But we went up to Helsingborg, which is the closest point to Denmark. There's Helsingborg on the Swedish side and Helsingor on the Denmark side, and it's a quick ferry ride, you know, 10 15 minutes to get across. So wow. I came to Sweden, went to Helsingborg, went back to Denmark so that Jurgen could buy a bunch of beer. Because <laughs> uh, you, you cross borders to buy your alcohol, apparently, because of the taxes and all that type of thing. So he got what he calls garage milk, 
Uh, we got a bunch of that. And then we came back to Sweden again, and then we drove over to Karlskrona where I stayed with them. So that was 98. So that was a, a fun time um, meeting them, you know, on their own turf for a change. <laughs> okay, we have a few um, short questions from the audience. Uh, let's see. Um, Lloyd said, did you have a natural affinity for the language? You know, uh, it's tough. It's a Germanic language. Uh, and so I have definitely made an effort to try to learn it. And Jakim Pratalita Svenska men jag måste lära mycket mer, which means I can talk a little bit of Swedish, but I have a lot more to learn. And I've got that phrase down so good that when I say it to people, they just instantly carry on in Swedish. And <laughs> I can read and understand uh, the written word uh, a lot better than I can understand when it's spoken to me. That's the tough part. I have a hard time hearing it, so I can pick out key words, but they have a tendency to talk fast and is very melodic. And so I struggled with much more than the basics when it comes to carrying on a conversation. But if you want to text and write and you know do messages and all that, I can do a little bit better. You probably, I'm sure there were words kind of that you had grown up with that, that you found out later were part of the Swedish language or. Yeah. And even just celebrating Christmas on Christmas Eve, our family always did. And I never thought twice about it. That's just how you do it. But that's a big thing in Sweden where Christmas Eve is the big day there. Christmas Day, you know, they're recovering, but uh, Christmas Eve is the celebration day. And our family had adopted that. And there's just so many little Swedish knickknacks around my grandmother's house here uh and uh different things that i took for granted uh growing up but now i can see how it all connects back to the motherland i see that uh, cindy says she still hasn't found her swedish line so do you have any tips or advice for for those that you know may know that they have swedish heritage um, and don't really know yet how they're connected or they haven't found kind of that uh the family that's still there well i guess uh and i heard this from daphna uh your colleague esther that uh, Sweden is the crown jewels of family genealogical records. The churches, and I've looked at them, the church records are very uh, articulate and specific about who was in what households and what village uh, and the time frames and all that. So there is a lot of uh, information and online and through my heritage uh, to be able to find those family connections. So I guess the thing would be is, you know, getting back to, you know, who came over on the boat uh, and because, you know, they, they lost track. Uh, the Swedish side lost track of keeping tabs on people uh, when they uh, left Sweden. Although I did see a document, uh, I don't know if it's on my laptop or not, but it shows that my great grandmother, Amelia from Irland, had her traveling papers. Uh, they had a document, we have a document that shows her going from Irland to America. So uh, on some level, there is some Swedish side documentation. Now she, she took it with her, obviously, for us to even have it in our possession. Uh, but there was something that was generated in Sweden that showed her voyage over here. Uh, you know, so, you know, the Mormon church is big on records. Uh, so there's probably a trove of uh, archives there that you can find uh, a relative that takes you back. Maybe that one generation to jump over the uh, borders into Sweden. And then the Swedish records could take over from there because they are pretty robust and complete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Sweden um, household... Uh, examination books I know are you know one of our most prized collections on my heritage really um an amazing collection where you can really follow a family through the years um you know through the various books to see how the family changed and evolved over the years so definitely Cindy check that out on my heritage if you haven't yet um we'll just take uh one last question here uh, marie asked of all the incredible swedish stories uh which one was your favorite i guess uh, stories of you know of ancestors uh, i love that shipwreck story <laughs> um, yeah it's hard to pick a, i guess the shipwreck story to me is the most fascinating of course you know getting wrapped up with the swedish royals was a pretty good story for me and you know i actually met crown princess victoria a couple of times because of that so in you know my lifetime, that's the that's one of the highlight stories for me is uh, getting uh, mixed up with the Swedish royalty. Uh, but the uh, the legend of the shipwreck to me has got to be the most interesting one. And I actually went to go uh, see if I could research like they must have records of sunken vessels and all that. Of course, when I went to the Siemens Museum in Stockholm, it happened to be closed uh, that particular season of time. So I've yet to unearth you know what is the authenticity or the you know I know that something happened. Uh, but you know the details of which I still have yet to validate. Maybe, uh, maybe in the future you'll find a connection to the royal family. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. That would be fun. 
yeah, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll create some records and link myself over to uh, Princess Victoria. And, <laughs> and oddly enough, you know, I was making my movie about an American coming over and running into the princess. Uh, so a princess marries an American in my little romantic comedy. Well, I guess uh, real life follows fiction because the second daughter, Princess Madeline, uh, met her American businessman executive and married him some years later. Like I say, I was before my time and I wrote their story for them. But, uh, you know, since that time, you know, there's so upset. The prince of uh, the, the prince in me came out after I started working on my my film. It was a Julia Stiles movie about the Danish prince and an American girl. And I was like, hey, wait a minute. That, you know, I was getting a lot of media attention back then. I'm like, hey, did you guys kind of think of that because of my story? And then all of a sudden it comes like, you know, welcome to Sweden, the uh, NBC TV series. You know, I had my little movie trailer right at the end there where she's like, welcome to Sweden. I'm like, hey, wait a minute. That's my line. <laughs> you know, so it's like, you know, that, that's been, you know, some uh, good stories, all the back and forth with the production ambitions that I have over there. But yeah. <laughs> One day, one day yeah. you'll, you'll go back and, and make make a film there. <laughs> yeah, let's hope. <laughs> um, so fantastic. We would now um, love to give away a My Heritage DNA kit to one lucky winner in the audience. Uh, we received so many nice comments of viewers who are looking to travel, uh, who either did travel to various destinations uh, to research their family history, or they're looking to. We understand that, you know, some places are still... Uh, closed or more restricted these days. So definitely we hope that in the future you're all able to uh, plan a heritage trip and do as Jason did and, and go and, you know, really research your roots and meet new relatives and see the houses where your ancestors, you know, were born. It's just so, it's so incredible and, and uplifting and inspiring to, to hear your story, Jason. Yeah. And one last bit of advice is, you know, it's Christmas time. And one of the big things and traditions in Sweden is the Swedish Yule board, the Christmas table, the smorgasbord of all the different foods. So if you want to get a little sampling of a lot of different kinds of things, find yourself a Swedish smorgasbord, a Yule board, a <laughs> Christmas table, and go give it a try. Oh, wow. That sounds, that sounds delicious. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, so we have, uh, one uh, DNA kit to one lucky winner. And today's winner uh, for leaving a comment in the comment section is Janice Wilkin. And Janice wrote to us and she said, I'm in BC, Canada. My daughter surprised me with a trip to England in 2017. We visited my grandmother's home in Staveley, Derbyshire. As a child, I often talked to my grandmother about a picture of her home elm tree house that held a special place on her dresser to actually stand on the grounds and look at her cherished home in person was overwhelming as i just stood and wept i can't even describe my emotions when we were invited inside so that's a really beautiful story janice and we'll be in touch with you through private message to claim your prize thank you so much for sharing it with us and Jason, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your yeah, journey. You're welcome. And thank you for inviting me, Esther. I really appreciate it. And uh, you've, you've really inspired all of us here in the audience. I know I'm inspired to go and, you know, get on a plane. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, always love, uh, I always love talking about it. So I'm glad you gave me the chance. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. We hope to see you all next time. Bye, everyone. Ciao. Hey, Doe.